because I got to watch the premiere of OWN TV's Kings of Napa. And I'm right here talking with Janine, the creator of the show. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be sitting down with you. Thank you. Now, I am very much in love with the first episode. When I saw the images of the series, I was like, oh my gosh, Black girl magic, Black man magic. Love, <laughs> love, love. Um, and I cannot help but think when I watched the first episode, it's a throwback to the classic nighttime soaps that I grew up watching that were not as inclusive. So what was your idea to uh, have this show pitch and for you to go on and be on OWN TV? I, listen, I have loved soaps from, you know, growing up and I winded up going to a vineyard about almost 10 years ago now. I was going with some friends. I was on my way there and I told my mom I was going to this vineyard in San Ayez called Rideau Vineyard. And my mother said, oh, that's owned by a friend of hers. And the friend, she said it was owned by her friend's cousin. And that friend was black. So I said, oh, mom, it's not black owned. It's, it's not. And she's like, it is black owned. And I said, it's not black owned. She said, black people own vineyards, Ginny. And like, what, <laughs> what, where are you? And I said, really? Near Santa Barbara? And she said, black people own vineyards. And whether this was, you know, seven or 10 years ago, it could have been seven, I don't remember. But I went there, I saw this place. I couldn't believe it. I, I ironically didn't get a chance to meet the owner, but a seed was planted in my head that this would be a great backdrop for an amazing series. And so I started thinking about these characters and thinking about how could I get it done? And it took a long time. Um, I've pitched it before where it got rejected. I tried to get it set up before. And eventually in the last two to three years, I set it up with OWN and I started developing it at their company. And I rewrote my script a million times from the one I was originally trying to hustle around town. And um, I made it into this family that we can all see ourselves in, in this crazy way. And it's aspirational and fun. And uh, it's just sort of a joy to be in. I love the sibling relationships in yeah. the first episode that I saw. And I have to say, you did not have a paper bag test with the show. And there's so many <laughs> different complexions of black with hair textures. I was just flabbergasted. While you were working with OWN TV, which I believe probably has a little bit of a change from other networks that you've worked with over the years, yeah. um, did they give you a lot of feedback with how they wanted the show to look? Look, I mean, clearly you're working with one of the most, or the most powerful woman in the world, her company. I mean, they definitely gave notes on how they wanted to look. I think visually as it relates to the cast, it was very important to me to show the different hues um, and shades and sizes and shapes of black people. When I go to a family reunion, there's every single color under the sun. You know, we are all family, we are all black, we are all, you know, descendants of, you know, the diaspora in some way. And we all look alike, not, not sorry, don't look alike, we all look different. And so I, I wanted to make sure I showed those differences. And I think that was very important to them. Um, but I think it's important that young women especially um, grow up and they see themselves and they don't feel like we are always perpetuating the same look as that we've seen in the past. That, that's what I'll say. <laughs> like, it's very important that young women see themselves and especially um, young black women, they need to embrace and cherish their blackness and not feel embarrassed by it, not feel like they wish they were a different shade, not be co-opted by watching you know, television thinking they have to look a certain way if they're black. I think it's time that we embrace all of the hues. And I think if you look at our show, you see that, you see Issa Rae did that, you know, on Insecure. And I think in this show, I just, I really wanted people to see themselves. One thing that I thought was fascinating about the first episode was how different each character is developing as yeah. far as their education, their behavior, even the way that they speak. With you and your writing team, did you have a, um, 
a writing board with each character to sort of figure out how you wanted them to be as it traverses for the eight episode series uh, here um, on Oprah TV? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I came into the room because I had this script for a long time. I had to do a lot of heavy lifting you know, prior to coming into the room because in order to get the room greenlit, I had to pitch where the characters were going. So I had this idea of here are all of the characters, this is where they're going to go. I was fortunate enough that I went and I started this room once it got greenlit and I put those characters on the board and with these new added brilliant minds, I winded up changing and we changed as a collaboration, the characters and we bolstered their arcs and made it better. I mean, when you get seven brilliant minds in a room, it always ups your game. And that's why you wanna choose a writing staff that's really, really talented and very rigorous because that ups your game. And so that's what we did. We looked and we said, August, let's take today and just talk about August's journey. And her journey, you know, should be complicated. It should be messy. It should be layered. It should be all of these things. And all of us, you know, co co contributed to that collaboration. There were so many drama bombs in the very first episode. Sister, rivalry, <laughs> brother ambition. Um, how did you all decide which um, drama bomb to drop over the course of the episode? I feel like they're going to be building with the series, but yeah. I, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this reminds me of the original dynasty when they <laughs> were fighting and, and, and found the pool. And I remember as a kid, everyone going like, oh, they found the pool fighting. <laughs> <laughs> right. I listen, the the show is a show about this dynamic family and it doesn't listen, it doesn't have the ability to travel around the world and, and like go to Italy or go to Paris and do all of these things. So the drama has to be within the family. You know what I mean? And so it was important to me that we made sure that the family had conflict and that the dynamics always triangulated. So you might have August and Dana having a rivalry, but you're gonna then triangulate that with August, Dana and Bridget now having a rivalry. You have you know, Vanessa and Melanie who have to deal with each other as sisters, but they have to triangulate too with their daughters. You know, because this show is really a sort of um, Romeo and Juliet between two sisters, meaning August and um, Bridget, but it's also a relationship story about another set of sisters, and that's their mothers. And so that those four characters had to have conflict. And then all of the other characters came in and made it messier and more dynamic. And that's where you have Auntie Bet, and that's where you have, you know, um, Christian and the uh, Melanie, you have other characters coming in to feel that. Rose, who plays Dana's wife, you will see as the season goes on, and she's kind of over here on the side, but she brings the drama as the season goes on. Yeah. Now, while you're writing each episode with the uh, writing team, did you guys have more of a pitch meeting or did you already have an overall idea of what you wanted each each? episode oh. to move forward on and then they sort of filled it out I had an idea of where I wanted the overall story to go and but then we filled it out as a collaboration and made the story stronger and embellished on it then once you put you put all of the characters like going down then you put all of the episodes going this way and then you fill in each person's arc then you'll look at episode two because one was done and you go these are all of the points we have to hit with each character then as a room we take a blank board and we start breaking episode two story and we break all of the acts and we do that together and we're rigorous about it you might go back home because that's your episode that you're writing and work on it at night more or on the weekend and then you bring in more ideas with the rest of the room and then once the story is broken we then take it off the board and it's assigned to a writer 
and the writer writes the story. So that's sort of the way each episode works. That's the style I learned from ER. I took that style and brought it to Criminal Minds. We did that on Claws, and that's sort of just how we did it. But everyone participated in breaking, and then people got an opportunity to like work on their own scripts. And then as the showrunner, you're kind of over all of them, you know, you know, making sure they're consistent. Now, I know you've been really busy because you're not only working on your new show, but you also are fini- you also finished the final season of Claws. How were you juggling all of that going on last year with um, with uh, COVID and just trying to to manage all of it? You know, it's been amazingly challenging because Claws finished actually. We had almost finished the show before the shutdown. We then shut down and then we came back to finish it. Um, I had been running the season for three seasons. And in the final season, I handed over the day-to-day show running to my heir parents, um, two amazing, phenomenal women who ran the day-to-day. So I was lucky while I was doing this show that it freed up the space for me. I was able to free up space by letting Claws daily get done here and I could work on Kings of Napa, et cetera. And then if there was an issue or there was something that they wanted to talk to me about or I needed to um, get in the trenches with, I would be brought in for that. But I mean, the name of the game is to hopefully find amazing writers that you can help pass the baton to. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Now, you have worked with Warner Brothers for years, from ER to the PJs. Um, What did you learn from working mostly in drama and then your cartoon moment (laughs) that you brought into your own show? (laughs) Well, it's funny, you know, starting off in comedy, you learn to be funny. You learn to bring jokes. And I remember, you know, I didn't want to write in comedy on a weekly basis. There was a point after the PJs and after Jamie Foxx where I was like, I think I want to write in drama because I like life and death. That was really real. Like I wanted to write about life and death and those stakes. And a lot of times at the time, those type of comedies didn't have that. So when I went to ER and even to Criminal Minds, I also brought humor. You know, I mean, I remember I wrote the, the, the first episode that John Leguizamo came over to ER and he was, it was his entry episode that introduced him. And I remember it was funny, it was snappy, it had that rhythm in it. And that's what kind of made ER pop, that we had humor, but we also had deep drama. You would be laughing and then someone would die and you would be crying. And so you wanna play those two things against each other because that's what makes you feel. So I brought that kind of style all the way to Claws, even to Criminal Minds. I would have them having banter and laugh, but then they would discover a dead body. Like that's just my style. (laughs) And so Claws was the same thing, Um, you know, Desna has this journey to kind of get a piece of the American pie and she's going to do it by any means necessary. She'll get Uncle Daddy out of her way. She doesn't care. She wants to launder her money her own way. She wants to be in the opiate game now. She wants to be a queen pin. But even though there might be life and death there, you're also laughing at times. So with Kings of Napa, I felt it was very important to not only be dramatic, but also to have quippy lines that were funny. Because whenever people laugh or they smile, that makes people lean in. And then if you're laughing and smiling, you kind of enjoy the ride a little better. And so that's just a stylistic thing. You know, I could have done it with no jokes whatsoever. And there's a time where you should have no jokes. But I think the funny lines are what everybody's on Twitter, you know, talking about, or they're talking about, look what Ani Vett said. Remember that line Dana said, you want those conversations. It was a fun conversation. And I tweeted live with all of you on Tuesday. And I plan on doing it this coming Tuesday as well after Martin Luther King Day. Um, One of the things that I also uh, noticed about um, the first episode was the... um, not only the set designs, 
which um, really showed the wealth of the King of Napa family, but also the uh, clothing choices. Everyone has very distinct looks. How was it working with your um, um, costume designer to make sure that each character's style fit them? The costume designer was amazing. She was somebody who I had tried to work with on Madam C.J. Walker, self-made. I, I shot that in Toronto as well. And I, I wasn't able to get her. And she was brought very distinct looks to each person. She made, you know, we, we just talked and, and we wanted to make sure that August was a fashionista. She was kind of giving you that you know, vibe of Carrie Brad, Bradshaw back in the day. And all of her outfits are fierce. You can tell she takes bold choices. And then, you know, Dana, we wanted him to be on point with a bespoke suit, somebody who was unapologetic and who whenever he walked in the room, you wanted to look at his suit. You know, we, we looked at Karen LeBlanc, who plays Vanessa, and we wanted a more regal elegance. And so all of those characters filled in the swagger of this generation of the money and the monogram clothes and look at what I'm wearing, the Gucci, the Valentine, all of that stuff. That's, that's Christian. Christian is the person who's like, I got this on and this on and this on, you know, whereas the father, Isaiah Whitlock is much more laid back. He's not throwing his money in your face. Um, I wanted Auntie Vet to feel like she was Fashion Nova down, she was cute, she knew, she, she, she knows her body, she loves her body, and she'll wear anything, and she's fierce. And so she developed that character. And Bridget's character, for example, we really wanted her to feel more earthy and grounded, giving us like that kind of Lisa Bonet vibe, and more, you know, earthy. And so that was sort of the palette, but I just had a genius who did it. And then in terms of production design, I had a production designer, Rupert, who was fantastic. And he, you know, he made sure that we curated every single piece of furniture. You could feel like they've traveled around the world. They've been to all different parts of Africa. They've been to Kruger for a safari. They've been to Italy. They've, you know, been to the best restaurants in France. And they've been, you know, to Spain and we wanted to feel that in the house. And my husband and I are big art collectors. I wanted art to be a really big part of the show. So we worked for about five months with a lot of the artists that are in our collection allowed us to use replicas for their, for, for the Kings. Um, and that way, when you look on the walls, you feel black contemporary art. And so it was a great place for us to get up and coming artists and more established artists. But when you look at the show, you definitely feel like they have a vibe, they have a lifestyle and they have a culture. I like the way you interweave not only wine, but also food and our cultural food. The dinner scene with the father and the kids were fighting and he tells him to, to, to stop. I was... I, I was fascinated. I was like, oh my God, this looks like my grandmother's uh, dinner when we used to have holiday dinners, but not in as fancy as a living room as that. <laughs> yes. I, you know what? I wanted, listen, I didn't want the show to feel, and this is something that I'm really trying to get out there in interviews, is I didn't want you to think, oh, they're rich. So they're acting rich and they're eating caviar. You know, I wanted you to feel like this is a Black family. The parents are from Oakland. The mother might be bougie, but the father's down home. He went to you know, medical school. He got a um, degree. He, he's a surgeon, but he has not forgotten where he comes from. And they eat like black people. They don't eat, they're not gonna make up some food. They eat oxtail, they eat chicken, they eat you know, red beans and rice, and we celebrate that. And just because they're rich doesn't mean they all of a sudden got some weird palate. And so when you'll see throughout the season, they'll be having a scene and they'll be, you know, eating macaroni and cheese and, and normal food and short ribs and like normal stuff. It's the fact that they're wealthy, they have a lot of it. And whenever they want to eat, it's at their service and there's somebody bringing it to them. And so I wanted, you know, we need to relax. We need to, um, enjoy ourselves. And I wanted to make sure 
when people saw the show, they saw a black family that had a lifestyle, that had a look, and were enjoying the finer things in life. And some of that was soul food, <laughs> you know? And it sounded like delicious soul food. I'm curious, was it real food? Were they able to eat it? <laughs> oh my gosh, you know what the problem? It was real food and they were able to eat it. And so literally we would be shooting and we would do a take and we would be like, where did the oxtail go? And they'd go like, someone would have eaten it. We're like, you can't eat, you have to pretend to eat it. You can have, you can have the plate when we're done, but you have to pretend. But they would really be throwing down. <laughs> wow. I want to know who was cooking your food on yeah. set because my cooking is not as good as my grandmother's. Ah, they, yeah, they were <laughs> really, they were really good. They were really good. And so... I'd like to segue into a congratulations for your um, um, for your collaboration with Warner Brothers and having your own um, what do you call it? Um, your own little nameplate there, so you're able oh, yes, to yes. pitch your shows. Yeah, my 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 production company deal. Yes, yes. And I'm always curious when I talk to people about their career path because I looked at you on IMDb and I got your um, your bio, and it looks like you had a very logical step into where you are, but I know people who are in the entertainment industry and it's never, it's rarely a um, linear line. It usually is a little bit of zigzag. Yes. Look, I got out here and it was very kind of like, there weren't as many options for TV stations. I mean, for, for streaming stations and streaming channels and networks, there weren't, there was like four networks, you know what I mean? And so there was, a very straight path to it. You know, I got into the Warner Brothers program from the Warner Brothers program. I winded up getting onto Lush Life and Jamie Foxx. And then my career kind of just stayed going. Um, I think during that time, as I've emerged as a writer, the idea was that you were to learn each step, keep learning and learning, and eventually you'd get your own show or try to get your own show. I think now with the invention of so many streaming channels, it will give opportunities to people of color and to women, they will have a shot to get their show on the air a lot sooner than it, you know, than it took me. And so I think this is great because I think we need more women, we need more black people and BIPOC people to tell their stories. And so the more people who get in the system that don't want to tell the traditional story, the better representation we'll have. And it will be better for kids growing up because they won't be like me who's looking at my mom saying, oh, it's not a black owned vineyard. They will already just go, oh, there's black owned vineyards because they would have seen it. But I think there's a million stories to tell, but we need we just need more people of color get getting the opportunity and or doing what other artists are doing and, and, and putting it online themselves. I would tell people don't wait for a network, put it online, shoot it on your phone, put it on YouTube. You know, you can you can shoot a series and if it catches fire online, the industry will find you. And, and that's the beauty of where we are right now. Now I'm curious, were you ever, um, did you ever have a mentor who would sort of guide your writing and help you um, as you traversed Hollywood? I've had many mentors along the way. Um, they have not shown up as mentors in that. I don't have, I'm gonna use John Wells as an example. I consider John Wells a mentor. He would probably be like, huh? what what is she talking about I don't have his I don't know if I have I, I don't know if I have his personal cell phone right now I don't go over to his house for Thanksgiving dinner I don't meet him you know at a coffee shop and talk and cry but what I have is an avenue to someone who is powerful so that when I have a problem they can give me advice on how to solve it. And that is part of mentoring. It might not look like, oh, bosom buddies, but it might look like 
I have a dream to get this type of show. How can I do it? This person, like a Wells, says, this is how we get that done if this is your goal. It could be, I'm having problems with X, Y, and Z with my budget. How do we do that? It might be claws shut down because of COVID. We're now going to go back and shoot during a pandemic. What are you doing? You want me to get on a Zoom and I will show you the way my productions are going to handle the pandemic. That's been the type of mentorship I've had with him. And I've had other people like Yvette Lee Bowser, for example. She's another person who I've been able to call upon ask advice upon, you know, um, text her late at night or send her an email and say, I have this problem. And Yvette's like, this is what I would have would do because when I had an issue like this, this is how I handle it. I can call her and say, um, in confidence, I'm dealing with this issue with a really powerful person. It could be someone at the studio, someone at the network and having her there to say, this is how you navigate that scenario. That's important. And then in terms of writers, I have had different writer friends throughout my career who have read my work, given me notes on my work, told me that's not a good or this second act needs work. And those people that are in my life that do that, I've had for a long time and I always continue to count on them. What has been the best advice um, that you have gotten that you still think of in your career over the past? You look so young, I'm going to say past 10 years. <laughs> oh, you're hilarious. Um, I, I think it's to keep writing and to keep rewriting. I mean, the luxury, when you have a lot of money on a show, you have more time. Right, that's really the issue, you have more time. So it's hard when you have to get things done in a crunch to get it out and to make it exactly how you want. But it's about writing and rewriting. And it's also about persevering. You know, this town is not only about talent, it's about perseverance. And the amount of times I've been, you know, fallen down, I've been knocked off my path, or I've, you know, been you know deterred in some way or something didn't go the way I wanted or planned you know you you have to sort of figure out how to get back up and get back up and do it again and try again and I think that's the difference most people that get some form of success in this town and in writing um deal with failure and they learn how to deal with failure because that's half of it. You succeed really, really, you succeed a lot and there's a lot of success, but you've got to be able to pick yourself up when things are bad or things aren't going right and figure out how to um, navigate it. And then also just sort of advocating for yourself. You know, my biggest thing I would tell people is don't wait for anybody to open the door. You've got to like, you know, break down the door yourself. Um, you know, my company is Folding Chair Productions and it is based on the Shirley Chisholm quote about, you know, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I really feel that way that like, don't wait for the seat at the table, bring the folding chair or break the table, get a new table. But, you know, you've got to create your own path. Um, and, and we've got to and, and be entrepreneurial. But write, just keep writing. <laughs> That's what I try and do all the time. And I also try and learn and listen. And I was really excited with the people that you selected to work with you because some of them, it didn't, doesn't look like you said to yourself, I'm going to hire the, the biggest people. I'm going to hire people of color who are women, who are men, who are this or that as long as they're candidate. Um, the first director was uh, Matthew Cherry, who I'm a huge fan of. I love his book that he had. Um, yeah. and I'm wondering, um, I know he does a second interview, the second, he directs the second, um, episode as well. You're working with him and other people with your production company. How did you select them to work with you on the, the show? Well, Matthew, for example, had a deal at Warner brothers where I also have a deal and I 
had heard he hadn't done a pilot yet. I knew he had just won the Oscar for Hair Love. And I really wanted to see whether he was interested in collaborating. Um, I was introduced to him by another executive and then we met, we talked, we got online, we got on Zooms, we talked. He first was like, I don't know if I can fit it in, blah, blah, blah. And then he called me back and said, okay, I can fit it in. And I just was very connected to his work. I think um, a lot of people that I've worked with as directors, you know, my producing director on this show is Winifred Young. I met her in Toronto. She was referred to me by other um, showrunners and she became, you know, my rock, my ride or die, the person on set holding it completely down. And it's amazing to see a woman do it and a woman of color do it. And she just did it. I had another person, um, Bossade Williams, and she, Bossade is Black, she is Canadian, and I got a referred to her by another writer as well, and we connected, and she was somebody who I had met through Stealth Me, and she winded up coming and doing two amazing episodes. And the final director was Corey Bowles, and Corey was another Black Canadian director. And I really wanted people of color for the first season. I That was very intentional. And um, I felt like we were going up there to do a show about this Black family. These will be the first calls that I make. And I'm open to anyone else. I, I'm totally open to anyone else, but I knew I could only have four directors to do each do two. And, and that's where I landed. But I think you're just trying to always find talent, find talent that gels with you, that vibes with you and gets what you wanna do. A lot of talent is really fancy and they, they, they're so, they, they are like, I won't do a pilot unless it's $15 million. But other people, you know, saw that this was a great opportunity to do a show on own about this black family and they um, ran at the opportunity. I wanted to also ask, how was the pitching to own TV for the series? Uh, did you get to pitch it directly to Oprah herself? <laughs> it's so funny that you asked that question because everyone asked that. I. Um, I first pitched another project to Oprah. I pitched with another writer. We were trying to do a really epic thing to, um, and so I went into the office to pitch to her. And I remember driving to the office and my heart was like racing. I remember taking the elevator upstairs and I could not speak. And then we're standing in the hallway and the door opened and she walks out with Ava. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is gone. This is just worse. This is awful. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful, but how am I going to make it through this conversation? And Ava, bless her heart, I know. And she saw my eyes get big. I was like, oh my goodness. And she ran over and hugged me and said, congratulations. Um, I can't wait to hear what you are doing. And then I, my eyes got bigger and then Oprah kind of looked at me and then that's how I met her. But I was extremely nervous and scared. I was sweaty. And then this weird thing happens where this force field comes around her and you just pull yourself together. It's very <laughs> odd. <laughs> just like, like oh it, it's like a conductor. And then it's like, enough. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm going to live my best life and I'm going to get through this. And then you can do it. It's very odd, but that's probably why she's the greatest, you know, um, interviewer and producer and one of the most powerful women in the world. Cause she has that way of, of, you know, calming you. And so subsequently when I pitched to her later, I was on zoom because we were in a pandemic and it was much easier to be on Zoom because I, when I would get nervous, I would move the, I would, I would move the paper over, so I just saw one eye. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I would get nervous meeting Oprah 
and Ava at the same time. That would just be, <laughs> that'd be too much for me. My head would explode or I'd bow, bow down and say, yeah, I'm not worthy, I'm like, not worthy. <laughs> you're just like, you're just, you, something happens where you get out of your body and somebody's like going, what is happening here? What is happening? Oh my God, that would be so exciting. And I have to ask you, you've worked from going from the quote unquote big four, which was, I believe, ABC, CBS, NBC. And Fox. And Fox. And now we have all these platforms, not only with the CW, which um, is partially owned by Warner Brothers, and as well as streaming service and YouTube. How has that changed your idea of creating uh, content and projects because what things look like on TNT or TBS or NBC or own TV. I mean, I think there's just more places to pitch to. And so when you're going out with an idea, you might have to, um, you might have to kind of cultivate it for a certain buyer, but hopefully that buyer other buyers buy similarly to. So if you're going with something that you want to pitch to HBO, you know, I'm going to also pitch it to Apple and to whatever, to own to Showtime and to Netflix. The more buyers, it's just the more shots you have to possibly get something on the air. It's still incredibly, incredibly hard. But I think since there are more places, there are more shots and that's great for writers. I'm a super nerd, so I'm very excited about Ava's new show, Naomi, on the CW. I'm wondering, because I know you like drama, have you ever thought of doing a sci-fi fantasy drama? And if so, please do it if you haven't thought of it. <laughs> okay. I Listen, yeah, I have. I, I've been submitted some stuff recently that I'm definitely toying with. I, I mean, I think I want to stretch and do things I haven't done. I you know, had great time doing, you know, Claws and other shows, but I want to do something kind of opposite that zags away from that. So I, I would definitely do something in that genre. And again, I'm, I'm just like you. I, I, I loved Naomi. I completely, I told people on Twitter, watch us at eight, then we'll go watch Naomi. Like, I love that show and am so thrilled to have that hero on for young women and young men very exciting and I feel like um, the last couple of years I've seen a lot more uh, diverse projects a lot more people of color black people Hispanic and Asian shows so I'm hoping to see not only the first season of Kings of Napa on own TV but the second season yes. and other projects <laughs> from yes you. that's what we need we need more stories I mean You've seen this because you were there on Tuesday night, but everyone's like, what is this? Why are all the black shows on Tuesday night? It's like a traffic jam. We need us all to win because all of the stories are vital and important and essential to be told about us. It's, they're all important. They are. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I look forward to joining you on Tuesday, watching OWN TV's King of Napa. I watch it on the app. Or for those who have it on their cable channel, they watch on cable. You can watch it on Hulu. Oh, <laughs> you can fantastic. watch it everywhere. <laughs> yes, you can. You can. You want Hulu Live, Hulu Live, and own on the app or on um, Oprah.com right now, and you can watch it. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Congratulations on a perfect first episode premiere. I look forward to joining you guys on Tuesday, and I'll be live tweeting uh, with all of you on Tuesday as I watch it. Okay, we'll see you Tuesday night. Thank you so much.